I am glad you're here tonight because in order for the male to get help, he has to respond correctly. Now let me tell you what's happening to the male. Maybe 96% of the men in this room never heard their father say to them, you make me proud, you done well. Fight back might seem like a terribly aggressive message, but I have come to believe that the Bible is right when it says the kingdom suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. I have come to learn that if you don't take it by force, you won't take it at all. The fair weather Johnny come lately saints who sit in the cut and wait for good things to happen spend years and life passes them by because they are not aggressive enough to seize the things that God has for them. I know you all are quiet because I up in your face but I want to deal with this you see because if we're going to fix the men we got to first understand their problem. Based on all of their research they concluded that dad is destiny. And what they meant was, so go the men, so go the nation. Not because your father is in the house, doesn't mean he's fathering you. If you read what God's conclusion of humanity's problem is, it may shock you. In the last chapter of Malachi, God concludes what man needs. He talks about the coming of the Messiah. And here's what he says in Malachi. He will come and he will return the hearts of the children back not to the mothers but to the fathers and the fathers back to the children otherwise he says I will curse the land which means whenever a society is crumbling and seem like it's under a curse God says it's because the fathers are absent aggressive nature I think that that's part of masculinity there needs to be something in you that will respond to the challenge at hand I'm not talking about physical fighting but I'm talking about that aggressive nature that causes you to not allow the enemy to take over your stuff it, it ought to be in a man and I and I would rather God have to slow me down sometime rather than push me forward I, I see so many men today that you always have to push them and prop them up and put bricks up under them and point them in the right direction and if you don't give them a back rub and a cup of coffee and a donut they can't make it through the night shift but we need some strong tough men who have steel in their back I'm tired of jelly back weak knees broke wrists limp wristed Johnny come lately passive men who will allow the enemy to come in and do anything and frankly I think the women are up against it sometimes because the Bible said that they are to be a help me but how can you help somebody who's not going anywhere there's nothing worse than being stuck in a secondary position behind a first man who won't move inevitably it'll make you want to push up against them and get out of hand sometime because you're in a dilemma if you have an anointing to help somebody and the person you're supposed to help has lost their shoes and tied their shoelaces backwards it puts you in a real dilemma and a lot of our women are frustrated because they're anointed to help somebody who has no assignment no agenda no focus and no goals Here's what's interesting and mysterious to me. Jesus, when he came to solve man's problem, never chose a woman as a disciple. Why? He came to fix humanity and he had to follow a blueprint. And the blueprint didn't call for women. So he knew he had to deal with what the blueprint called for and it called for the males to be fixed first. The Bible says he chose 12, but the women followed. It's a very important scenario here. Men, you got to go get men. Women just show up. Let's have church, they say. But men, they play in sports. They out in the clubs. They drink in liquor. They smoke in dope. They in jail. You got to go get them. That's why churches are filled with women. He was dealing with healing humanity. These spoiled brat mama's baby boys need to go back home to mama and we need some real men to rise up and begin to fight the good fight of faith. It's one thing to need encouragement and it's another thing to need a diaper and a baby bottle. Can you hear what I'm saying? And it is a dilemma and many people are in a dilemma because life demands that a man have a certain amount of strength and a certain amount of aggression and even nature teaches that a man should be aggressive. The moment his body begins to secrete a hormone called testosterone, it causes him to have a more aggressive disposition. Even in little boys, you see them becoming more aggressive. It's hard to harness this energy 
energy that begins to rise up in the masculine soul because he has that innate God given tenacity that makes him want to conquer. God put Adam in the garden and told him to subdue it and have dominion over it. And there ought to be something in a man that makes him a conqueror, something secreting in his genes and coming up out of his spirit. And when I say genes, I'm not talking about Levi's, something coming up out of his spirit that causes him to be strong and relentless and tenacious about the things he goes after. No one respects the male anymore, so he doesn't respect himself either. And then men also lost what I call their own manhood. This is why they try to define manhood in very difficult ways. Now let me tell you the result of all of this crisis. First of all, the challenge is, is that the male is struggling with his purpose. He doesn't know why a male was created. He also is struggling with his manhood. He doesn't know what it is to be a man. And he also doesn't know what it is to have authority. He's trying to regain authority by force or by abuse. Men are also struggling with their self-image. They're not sure how to be a man, so they, they imitate other men who are not worthy of imitation. They're trying to find their image. Now, what's the result of all of this confusion for the male? First of all, the male lost his self-image. We got to deal with that. Secondly, he lost his self-concept, self the picture of what a man's supposed to be like. He also lost his self-confidence. That's why most men are very timid, very shy, and very angry. They also lost their self-worth. They don't feel valuable anymore. So you're struggling just to feel important to your wife. We also lost our sense of self-esteem. What makes us feel significant? We began to hate ourselves. We lost our self-love. And therefore, we lost our conviction. Most men I meet have no conviction in life. They just want to kind of pay a bill and die. There's no sense of assignment, no sense of, of purpose, no sense of, of, of living for a reason. No conviction. This resulted in a condition that we're dealing with. I call it the male condition. And yet many, many of us, our plans are aborted because they have been committed into the hands of passive, generic, easygoing men who are so sedate and so calm that they let anybody do anything at any time and stand up about nothing. These men have become so passive and so timid that they need to be healed. But I'll tell you something. You show me a passive, timid, intimidated, insecure man, and I'll show you a man that's been violated sexually, emotionally, or spiritually spiritually in some way of his life because God created the man in the likeness and the image of God and there ought to be something in a man somewhere that roars like a lion and not whimpers like a kitten. There ought to be something down inside of you that roars to fight the good fight of faith. It's going to be a rough one this morning. And understanding that even strong men struggle and no matter how strong you are and no matter how relentless you are, there are moments in your life that you find yourself in overwhelming circumstances. David certainly was not a passive man by any stretch of the imagination. You might misunderstand him. He was certainly in touch with his soft side, but he had the kind of assurance that comes from a man who's comfortable enough in his masculinity that he's not afraid to express all sides of himself. Where are my brothers at in here? Please don't misunderstand David because if you made David mad, David was known to kill a hundred Philistines and cut their foreskins off and throw them like rings at the feet of the king. David didn't take any stuff. He was radical when he was a boy. He was a boy killing lions and bears while other boys were playing. David was killing lions and bears getting ready for the next fight. By the time he got ready to fight a giant, he had a resume of dead carcasses laying behind him saying, I, you don't know who you're fooling with. I whipped the lion and I whipped the bear and the same God that delivered them into my hand is going to deliver you into my house. I'll whip you too. I'll knock your head off. He didn't have nothing but a rag and a rock, but he knew how to work it. And when you know how to work what you got, God will bless you with the victory. He knocked him in the head. Good God. Now, brothers, listen to me, brothers, listen to me. The average man is confused. Why? He's confused about everything. He don't know who he is, why he is, where he is, what he is, and why he's going, where he's going. He don't, he don't understand the women, don't understand what women want, don't understand what society wants from him. So he's confused. And therefore, he's also angry. 90% of the men in this room are angry men. You won't admit that, but I know that's true. And your anger is deeply concealed. I guarantee you that all the men in prison are angry men, all. Listen, I've done interviews with these men for my books. Everyone was angry. 
and 90% of us angry at their father who they never met or who they never saw or who was never there or who they couldn't talk to they were angry and their anger comes out in frustration and the frustration comes out in self-hatred and the self-hatred is manifested in depression and most men are depressed and they quietly carry their anger and they are afraid it's called concealed fear and that fear makes them violent in other words if I can't be a man because I can't buy you clothing and shoes I'll slap you to show you I'm a man why? I'm a man he says he's angry he's angry at society and that anger is in this room we gotta get rid of that anger Domestic violence comes from resentment. Resentment means you transfer what you are feeling to other people. You blame them for your own behavior. My father wasn't there. My mother mistreated me. I was abused when I was small. I mean, this resentment, we transfer it. That results in social abandonment. That's when men give up on society. There's no hope. No use me going to school. No use me going trying to get a good job. No use to me trying to advance myself. They just abandon themselves to society and say, I'm not getting involved in the rat race, they say. They give up. And so we got gangs all over the city. We got all kind of social clubs. We got all kind of fraternities, all these different things we try to, because we've given up. And the last thing is that men manifest this hatred in domestic abdication. Abdication means he decides to leave the home. Can't take it anymore, I'm out of here. That's why divorce rates are so high. Infidelity is so high. Abandoning kids is so high. Spreading your sperm around the city is so high. Why? You just abandon society. Domestic abandonment. I ain't, lady, I'm out of here. I'm out of here, woman. I'm gone. Because the man is suffering that whole list. David didn't take in his stuff. He practiced victory. And that's what's wrong with our children. We need to expose our children to early victories. You ought not always run down to the school about everything. Some stuff little Johnny's got to learn how to deal with. We protect our boys too much. We don't let them deal with any kind of problem. That's why they grow up so weak and passive and need somebody to rescue them all the time. You don't rescue them out of everything. Some things you got to deal with yourself so that you learn how to become a victor. And you can't be victorious until you've had conflict. Sometimes you ought not save them from the conflict. Throw Jonah overboard and teach him how to swim. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. They'll never learn how to fight if you protect them from everything. You might be standing over in the corner watching in case the thing gets out of control. But every now and then you got to throw him in there and say, you got to go back to school tomorrow and you got to deal with that. So he can get some victories up under his belt. It changes the way you walk and how you talk and you hold your head up straight. Once you have come through something, you get some boldness. You feel a kick from your testosterone when you whip something. Just because you got testicles doesn't make you a man. I told you it was going to be rough tonight. This is your last Last chance to get out if you're gonna hit the door you better go for it now it is possible to be a male and not be a man but if you're not a man life will break you into itty bitty little pieces and throw you at the feet of some woman's doorstep and you'll be either swept up or stepped over the rest of your life and such are some of us today but not David David was a man of war and he talks about his relationship with God he said he teaches my fingers to war yeah, teach me how to fight. He said God taught him how to fight, how to not be a wimp, how to not just roll over and lay down and run home crying. Every time he ran into an opposition, God taught him how to stand with his head up and his back straight and deal with the issues of life. He was a warrior. Let me tell you something. Even getting saved doesn't solve this problem. I know of preachers who beat their wives. I know preachers who curse at their children, mad. Press of their wives, slap them, and then preach the next morning. Because they never dealt with the real issue, manhood. Why is this important to talk about? Because if we don't deal with this, this is the response we're gonna get. Now hear me and hear me good. Some of you women are in trouble because you connected with somebody. Johnny's real cute, but he has no spine. He's six foot two and fine, but the boy got no spine. Six two and fine is wonderful. That's all you need when you're 17. But when you're 37, fine don't mean a thing if you ain't got no spine. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. 
takes a lot of fight to deal with life. You have to deal with obstacles and deal with barriers and deal with situations. And David was used to winning. And that's what the Bible calls a mighty man of valor. Are there any mighty men of valor in here? Mighty men of valor are men who accept the challenge of life. They accept responsibility, whether they're right or they're wrong. When they do something wrong, they accept the responsibility and they say, I was wrong. They don't blame everybody for everything. They stand up and say, I was wrong about it, but this is what I'm going to do to fix it. A mighty man of valor doesn't mean that you always get it right, but it means you don't run home to mama when you get it wrong. You stay there and work it out and put it back together again because you're a mighty man of valor. Are there any mighty men of valor in here? Yeah, that means that you've been kicked, you've been shoved, and you've been shot, but you're still standing on your post, ready to fight the good fight of faith. That means that you can take a licking and keep on ticking. That means you've been through hell and back, but you're still standing as a testimony that the Lord is on your side. Your eye may be black, and your teeth may be busted, and your lip may be swollen, but you look the devil in his eye, and you say, baby I'm still here that's who I'm talking to today some mighty men of valor mighty men identify yourself if you are a mighty man of valor you are a rare and precious commodity I am concerned because men are on the hit list of hell the Bible warns us in the scripture that they were out to kill. The Bible says in the King James Version, they were out to kill everything that pisseth against the wall. It means men. Everything that urinates standing up, the devil is trying to kill. The devil is after the seed. He's after the male. He's after what the Hebrew word is zero. He's after the seed giver because a womb can't carry life if a seed giver doesn't produce it. He that goeth forth weeping and bearing precious seeds. Men, you are seed givers. And the devil wants to stop you from being a sower. Because if he can stop you from being a sower, he will stop you from being a reaper. Are there any reapers in the house? Where are the men at? Are there any men in here? And the problem with the mighty man of valor is that a mighty man of valor is used to winning. Everything you jumped in, you whipped it. Everything you jumped on, you conquered. Everything you attacked, you brought to his knees. But sooner or later, you'll run into something you can't whip. You might not believe it today, and you might think I'm an old fuddy duddy. You might think I'm foolish and stupid and ignorant. But sooner or later, you will run into something that makes you question everything you thought you did well. You haven't lived till you fail so badly that you wonder, will I ever get back up again? You don't know who you are until you've made a mess so bad that you can't even figure your way out of the situation and you've got to call on God because you've made a complete mess of everything and everything is out of your control. And frankly, man, you won't worship God effectively until you have lost control and begin to recognize that you are not God. That's what makes you get down on your knees and call on God when you get in something you can't get out of It'll make you seek God. Here's what I am recommending, because I think you're responding correctly. One, for the male to have solutions to his problems, he must first recognize he need help. And that's tough for a male to admit. Secondly, he must accept the need for help. And thirdly, he must admit that he doesn't know some things. You know, man, you know how we are. We think we know everything. You know what can tell me nothing. I ain't going to no seminar. I'm a man. I ain't going to no conference. I know who the man is. You don't know who the man is. You can't even sleep with your own wife. You got to admit you don't know some things. I read four books a month. That's a tough thing to do. The reason why I read so much is because I don't want to be stupid. I got a family, a wife and kids that I have to lead. I have companies that I have to lead. Presidents and prime ministers look to me for advice. I got to keep reading. When was the last time you read a book and finished it? And that goes to you pastors too, because many pastors don't even read a book, including the Bible. They only read the Bible for sermons. You know why you don't read? You think you know everything already. That's your problem. You got to admit that you don't know. And number four, you must seek the help of successful men. We go to the wrong men to get help. Here's a guy who's been divorced five times and you go to him for advice. That's stupid, man. I'm talking with your brother. I mean, your blood brother. He can't even stay married. Don't listen to him. You're talking to men who never had a business and want a business advice from them. Seek successful men and then submit to them. And number five, commit yourself 
to pursue knowledge. Men, I challenge you to decide from this night forward that you're going to turn your home into a library. You have to do this, brother. No one can learn for you. No one. Commit that you're going to change after this night. You're going to become a pursuer of knowledge as a man. You got to pursue knowledge. And number six, write this down. Invest in your own education. Listen, man, it costs money to buy books and CDs. You, your pastor got a bunch of CDs in that store back there, and you never go there and get a CD from five years ago. Why? You think you know everything. Invest. The value and the cost of ignorance is always higher than knowledge. The Bible says all you're getting, get understanding. And then it says if it costs you all you have, get understanding. Proverbs 4 verse 7. You got a choice between a book and a box of chicken after this meeting. When you eat chicken, it stays in your system for six hours. But you buy a book and read it, it stays forever. You have to invest in your own development. And number seven, accept your weakness. Men, if you're going to become real men, first you got to be honest with yourself where you are weak. I don't know everything. I got a problem in this area. I got a habit that's killing me. I have a weakness for women. I got a weakness for drugs. I got a weakness for liquor. In other words, be honest first. Stop pretending, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you're okay. And then secret pornography is eating you up. Accept your weakness. Because I can't help you unless you first tell me you need it. Jesus never volunteered a miracle. Never. Every miracle he performed was a result of a question. What can I do for you, he says. He met a blind man one time. He said, what can I do for you? I mean, come on, it's supposed to be obvious. No, it ain't obvious, because the blind man made his money by his blindness. You gotta accept that you need help. Number eight, when you identify your weaknesses, magnify your strengths. Every male in here got some strong things in his life that are very good. You are a good man, believe me. You've done some bad things, but you are a good man. And we gotta go after the good man inside of you. I wanna read a verse to you. I call it the call to men. David was a great father. His son was Solomon. David was a great king, a great politician. David is on his deathbed about to die. I want you to read what David says to his son. It says in the book of 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to his son, Solomon. Now watch a father talk to a son. Quote, I am about to go the way of all the earth. So be strong and show yourself a man. Now that's a good statement from a daddy. Come on, give David a hand. That's, that's, that's good stuff, right? That's quite a powerful, isn't it? What a good word for a father to say to a son. Son, I'm about to die. Show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. That's in the Bible. He says, first of all, observe what the Lord your God requires. Secondly, walk in his ways. Thirdly, keep his decrees and his commands. Fourthly, he says, keep his laws and requirements that are written in the book so that you may prosper in all you do. And wherever you, wherever you go, son, you're going to be okay if you keep the law I taught you. What is a good daddy talking? Did your father leave you the word of God like that? Or he just kind of left you? He just left you, didn't he? He left you when you were nine. He left you when you was 14. He left before you was born. And no man ever came to you and says, now show yourself a man because most men don't know what a man is. That's why I'm here. I'm here to show you how to be a man because most men don't know what a man is. David says, show yourself a man. And he knew what a man looked like. A man who keeps the law of God, keeps his requirements, who obey his statutes, who walk in his ways. He said, David, if you do that, you'll make plenty of money. You'll live long. You'll keep your body pure. You won't drink liquor and smoke dope. You won't keep bad company. You'll prosper. The last part, he says, and the Lord will keep his promises to me. He said, listen, son, if you be a man, the promises God gave me will be fulfilled in you. Do you have a son? Are you talking to your son? See, it's one thing for the kids to come running to mama, which is a normal order. And it's another thing for a woman to be able to turn over and run to him. But who does he go to? Because the real truth, sisters, if you want the real truth, there are some days that we want to fall apart on you. Most of us manage to make it through the night without that, but that doesn't mean we don't feel it. That doesn't mean we don't deal with it. The truth of the matter is we generally swallow it and keep on smiling, trying to be everybody's Superman, everybody's hero, 
trying to always deliver. There are men in this room, everybody has their number. Mama's calling you, move the refrigerator. Sister's calling you, move the couch. Wife is calling you, fix the refrigerator and the stove. Everybody's calling you anytime there's a situation, anytime there's a problem. And a man develops a Superman, what I call a Superman complex. He wants to be everybody's Superman. He puts on his boots, he's got on his cape, and he wants to leap off of buildings in single bounds and fix everybody's situation. And people love him as long as he does that. But the moment they find out that Superman is really Clark Kent, they don't know how to deal with it and sometimes he doesn't know how to tell them because he's ashamed to admit that your hero is really human. And in the face of kryptonite, because every man in this room has his own brand of kryptonite. And in the face of kryptonite, it will sap your strength. And let me tell you something, when you attach yourself to a real man of God, not only do you reap their benefits, you also inherit their enemies. That's why the Bible said, if you suffer with me, you're going to reign with me. A lot of people want to reign with you, but they don't want to suffer with you. When the test is over, here come everybody wanting to jump in. You get ready to dedicate the building, here come everybody with a big long hat and somebody to carry it. But when you're trying to pay for it, they'll thin out on you in a minute. Because everybody wants to come when the cake is baked, but nobody wants to grind the flour. Lord, help me to preach in here. My son is 27 years old, I told you. And he hugged me. He said, Dad, have a good trip. A lady came to me. She says, is that your son? I said, yes. And she started crying. She said, he's a man. I said, yeah. 27 years old, he's a man. He just told you he loved you. I said, yep. I always tell my son I love him. She cried. She said, my husband left my son when he was seven years old. And no man ever hugged him. Told him he loved him. Now my son is 18 and he's in prison. Do you tell your son you love him at age 18? Did your father tell you? is the question. Defects. The vision God gave you is supposed to be transferred to your son. Why is the male so important? Let me give you the first answer. Number one, because the male is God's strategy for ruling the earth. That's how important you are, man. You are God's secret weapon and the devil knows it. That's why the pressure is on you. The devil is so afraid of men, he sends women to church. The devil is not afraid of women, I'm telling you. He don't care how many of them come to church and worship God. Keep the men out of God's presence because the devil knows the strategy. Why is man so important? Because the male is God's foundation for his human family. When I discovered how important I was, my whole thinking changed. 